it really is like a very weak surface level <laughs> argument to like compare what Athena is doing to Luna. Like really the core difference here, you've just got to think about what is actually backing uh, the stable assets. Really what I'd point to here as the core difference between a Luna and an Athena is that the backing is like real collateral that's sitting behind the stable rather than like our own governance token. Heads up, everyone. In the next few weeks, we're launching a new show on the Unchained channel called Bits and Bips, exploring how crypto and macro collide, one basis point at a time. As you can guess, it's a show all about crypto and macro topics and where they intersect. We've started with some trial runs, and they've been going so well, we decided to tease a few moments in this podcast. The speakers you'll hear throughout this episode include Ari Paul of Block Tower Capital, James Seifert of Bloomberg Intelligence, and Ram Alawalia of Lumida Wealth. We'll play the first clip from Bits and Bips featuring Ari now, and then it'll be on to the main show. I've always been skeptical of DAOs in the short term because it's an immense undertaking. There's a lot of complexity there people don't fully appreciate, but I'm very bullish on the long term conceptually and disruptive. I think they're going to be as disruptive as the birth of the corporation was um, in enabling higher wow. forms. <laughs> Literally, that scale, and yeah. and it comes down. It's like when you when you enable a hundred x speed increase, you get more than incremental improvements. You enable entire new forms of commerce and coordination and economic activity. So right now, we're in a world uh, where if you and I, Ram, wanted to spin up a company, we're looking at at least two weeks: a Delaware filing, five thousand dollars in legal fees, a bunch of fi- you know filings, an employment contract. If you and I could create that company in ten minutes on a right. DAO right. dashboard. Right. Right. Maybe there's a lot of stuff we do together that we wouldn't even think about doing today because it's too burdensome. Yeah. And then when you have AI, that does it's not, you know, then you have companies being created and dissolved within seconds. Hi everyone, welcome to Unchained, your no hype resource for all things crypto. I'm your host, Laura Shin, author of The Cryptopians. I started covering crypto eight years ago, and as a senior editor at Forbes, was the first mainstream media reporter to cover cryptocurrency full time. This is the April 5th, 2024 episode of Unchained. Polkadot is the original and leading layer zero blockchain with over 2,000 plus developers. And the Polkadot 2.0 upgrade will be a massive accelerator for the ecosystem. Join the community at polkadot.network slash ecosystem slash community. With iTrust Capital, you can buy and sell crypto in a tax advantage retirement account. Enjoy significant tax advantages, 24-7 access, and the industry's lowest fees. Today's guest is Guy Young, founder of Athena Labs. Welcome, Guy. Hey, thanks for having me on. Athena had a big week launching its governance token with a massive airdrop and starting your next points program. Plus, there were some big announcements involving Athena and MakerDAO. But first, before we dive into all these recent events, let's just start by having you explain what Athena is and how it works. Yeah, sure thing. So the basic product idea here is we're trying to create a synthetic dollar that's disconnected from the existing financial rails. So the idea here is that you're using crypto collateral and derivatives within crypto to, to offset one another. And so those two things come together, creating the synthetic dollar. It was originally an idea that Arthur Hayes proposed in his blog, Dust on Crust. And myself and the team basically took that that idea in, in the blog post and tried to bring it to life with Athena. So yeah, the basic and core product here is a synthetic dollar that's backed by ETH and Bitcoin, and then corresponding short positions against that, which you can then tokenize and, and issue a stable asset. And you keep using the term synthetic dollar, which I believe is um, like there's a choice behind that instead of the word stable coin. So can you talk a little bit about why it is that you prefer that term? Yeah, sure. Um, I guess there's been other projects that have actually tried a similar thing to Athena in the past. They, they did it all on chain and uh, they used the word stablecoin to actually market their product back then. I think since that point in time, though, the industry has sort of moved on and we've had to think a bit more deeply around how we're actually uh, marketing these products to users in terms of actually trying to distinguish between the different risk profiles. So it was something that actually like we originally came out with the name stablecoin as those other projects sort of had done in the past. And I actually got called out by Orson Campbell back in October 23. Uh, where he said that I think we should sort of reconsider how we're actually positioning this product. Um, I came out publicly and I actually agreed with with Olsen and I said that we definitely should. And I think that actually applies to products, uh, not only like Athena, but like more broadly. 
I think part of the issue here is actually that stable points have a pretty wide uh, design space where you have many different types of flavors and attempts to, to sort of produce a, a stable asset within crypto. So you've got the fit, fit sort of stable coins, which everyone knows, like USDC and USDT, and you've got different flavors of like CDPs with MakerDAO and, and many others that look like them. And then Athena, which is like more of a delta neutral design. What all I'm trying to achieve here by calling the synthetic dollar is actually just trying to distinguish between a risk profile with USDC and USDT and what we're doing because the risks are fundamentally different. Uh, that's not to say one is better or worse in, in any other way. We should always like think about these things on a risk adjusted basis. But I think uh, all I was trying to achieve there was just distinguishing between the risk at least. And so with a fiat stable coin, then the risk would be, uh, would reside in the centralized player that is custodying the assets that back that stable coin, um, or in the case of something like Circle, you know, where they're custodying those assets. So with something like Athena, how would you describe the risks for this synthetic dollar? Yeah, I think the custody risks also apply here. So you can think about Athena sort of taken normal fiat stable coin is basically T-bills or bonds sitting in a bank, and you can move that into crypto collateral sitting within the crypto ecosystem. Um, I think within crypto, you sort of have three different buckets of wh where are the actual assets residing. You can have them in a smart contract on chain, you can have them on a centralized exchange or in a, in a institutional grade custodian. Where the assets actually sit within Athena are those custodians. And we thought that that was like an acceptable trade-off to basically have assets which are not actually on centralized exchanges but actually i think something that is worth sort of considering here is actually the risk profile of a smart contract versus custodians where i think we've just seen some reports that have been out in terms of like the probability of default of actually leaving your assets within a smart contract i think we can all agree that like actually DeFi, for all of the things that are amazing about it it is still i think too unsafe in terms of the number of hacks that we actually see and i think just looking at the data we sort of took the view that actually holding assets within custodians was a was a pretty reasonable place to have it. Uh, that is to say, there is still custodial risk here, and you have like some counterparty risk to the exchanges as well. But I think with, with stable-like assets or anything that has like a backing, it's always going to be the custodial element, which is the most important piece. All right. So, you know, as we mentioned earlier this week, ENA launched, which is your governance token. And um, this was after a six-week shard campaign or points campaign. And it launched to a market cap of $1.2 billion. As of the time of recording, it's at about 1.6. And the fully diluted cap is about $17 billion. So how did the launch go compared to how you thought it would go? Yeah, I think um, we're all pretty pleased uh, with how it went. I think um, obviously the market conditions this week uh, weren't amazing. I think the like generally BTC and ETH are down pretty bad this week, and we've seen like a bit of a leverage wipe. But um, yeah, I think that I was pretty proud of the team in terms of how we sort of executed things, and this is like the first time any of us have ever done this. And so uh, you're always a bit nervous sort of going into these weeks when you haven't actually done it before. But yeah, I think we're pretty pleased with how it went. And when you say you haven't done this before, can you talk a little bit about your background? Yeah, sure. I was uh, I was working TradFi before I came to crypto. Had sort of been in, in the space as like uh, investing on the side since like 2019, um, but actually hadn't you know built a project or, or founded something before. And so a lot of this stuff is like pretty new when you're coming out with a token launch. And uh, yeah, obviously just nervous when there's a lot of eyes on on what you're doing. And so now that you have Eno. You know, what are your plans for using it for governance? Yeah, I think there's um, a bunch of different areas. And this is something that people have been picking up on Twitter, just in terms of like how you're actually constructing the product or actually just thinking about the risk profile going forward. So there's like, you can run a theater in like an extremely aggressive way or in a slightly more conservative way. And I think that a lot of people have different opinions as to where you should sort of sit on that spectrum. So just as an example here, even just like how much stake ETH is sitting on the Athena backing, like is 100% the right number or is it actually zero? What is the composition between ETH and BTC? Should you think about different assets like Sol? We have like an insurance fund that sits behind USD as well. What is the size of that? How should we allocate cash flows to that? I think there is actually quite a bit of decentralized like decision making that should be going into this to actually like define uh, what is the risk profile and like general direction of the product. And so for now, that, that's sort of like the, the key role that that is playing within the system. 
And so now Athena's launched phase two of its incentives program, which you've dubbed the SATS program. And you just alluded to this. Um, you'll be bringing on Bitcoin as collateral. Why did you decide that that was your next step? Yeah, I think for us, it's really um, about scalability. Scale has always been like, there's obviously just trade-offs in every decision that you're making. And like scalability has always been like at the forefront of my mind in particular. And I, we're not sort of fully exhausted in terms of the market opportunity on ETH right now. So at the moment, Athena's short interest within the market is roughly around 20% of like the entire ETH uh, global open interest. I think that that number can sort of push a bit above study, but that's like a natural constraint that you sort of start to come into. And so it's just a natural sort of path that we've taken where you want to start diversifying into different assets with huge derivative markets sitting behind them. Uh, so for us, obviously, Bitcoin is, is a natural next step. Uh, just for reference, the size of the Bitcoin market um, is enormous. It's like north of $35 billion of open interest. And so that just gives us a huge amount of runway to action move into and sort of scale the product from where it is now in like $2 billion to something that's closer to 10 And are there additional benefits that you see from adding Bitcoin? You know, obviously in DeFi, uh, things tend to sort of stay in the Ethereum universe or, or at least similar chains to that. So uh, this is a little bit different. I don't know if you, you know, view it as having additional benefits. Yeah, well, I think one benefit is obviously just the liquidity around um, Bitcoin itself. So one risk of Athena is actually just how liquid is the collateral that's sitting behind the backing so that when people actually want to redeem, you can give them back their assets at like a reasonable spread. And so using like highly liquid assets sitting behind anything that people can redeem is obviously just a, a risk that you'd be running on the liquidity side. So moving into Bitcoin actually makes like the redemption process around Athena actually cheaper just because of like the depth around the BTC markets themselves. And then to your question around how we're sort of thinking about BTC being involved with uh, a project that's like fundamentally built on Ethereum. The one thing that looks a bit different here is obviously because Athena is touching a lot of off-chain centralized infrastructure. Um, that obviously has a, an ability to be able to deal with like raw BTC. You're not touching like wrapped Bitcoin on Ethereum. Uh, you can basically just think about the, the Athena front end and sort of the infrastructure that sits on chain. It's essentially just a front end that's accepting assets and issuing USD in return. And then those assets are sent through to the custodians on the other side. And once they're with custodians, you're just holding like nat like native BTC basically in the background. So it's not actually there like on Ethereum. You'd be holding that in a custodian who's sitting and basically connected to a centralized exchange in the back end uh, with Bitcoin. So that's sort of how we're solving for some of the complications around dealing with assets, which are like non ELC20. Yeah, it's something that I find interesting about Athena is uh, this mix between like decentralized and centralized. Um, so in a moment, we're going to talk about some of the other partnerships that Athena is making. But first, a quick word from the sponsors who make this show possible. Polkadot is the original and largest layer zero blockchain with over 2000 plus developers. The anticipated Polkadot 2.0 upgrade will be a massive accelerator for the ecosystem, upgrading the infrastructure with eight times higher transaction throughput and twice as fast block times, tailored core time for the needs of every protocol, trustless bridges to multiple chains, and revised tokenomics with a token burn to reduce inflation. Perfect for GameFi and DeFi to build, grow, and scale. Get your Web3 ideas to market fast. Think big, build bigger with Polkadot. Join the community at polkadot.network slash ecosystem slash community. Here's another clip from Bits and Bips featuring James Seifert and Ram Alawalia. A couple months ago, uh, Roundhill launched YBTC, which is a covered call Bitcoin futures ETF. The thing is yielding 40%. Wow. Um, it's done pretty well, but it's vastly underperforming spot, as you would expect in a covered call product. But you're getting yield of forty percent. That's so the somebody... JEPI product equivalent for yes, Bitcoin. Yes, exactly. Right. So this is a little. This is like this is this is the JEPI, uh, but on Jeppy. like uh, crack. <laughs> do you want to do you want to explain what JEPI is for the audience? Yeah. So JEPI basic. So there's JEPI and JEPQ. So the way JEPI and JEPQ work is they own the underlying stocks, uh, a select set of underlying stocks, and they actually go for low vol. So they're 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 it's more capital preservation with a little bit of income on top of it. And what they do is they write calls on top of it. They use derivatives on the top and they sell those calls and they earn income. The downside is so the upside is if the market's trending sideways or going down, you're getting income from those calls that you sold. But if the market starts ripping, you're going to underperform. That said, a lot of people that are buying these things theoretically should be buying them in, in your retirement or closer to retirement. That would be the reason you would do it because you need income. Um, they're going to underperform over the long term on a total return basis, right? 
Um, so Jeppy does it with the S&P 500 product uh, index. JPQ does it with the Qs. So that's the new big hot one. People love that thing. For some reason, it really hit its stride on Wall Street Pets on Reddit. And a lot like of people- 22, were like crazy. during the bear market, it really hit its- And then 23. Oh, yeah. I don't yeah. think they're I mean, good products right now, though. I, I get rid of them. They're, they're uh, still pulling in money. They're still doing well. And they're not seeing yeah. much in outflows. But but why BTC is the same thing. You're selling calls above the current price of Bitcoin and you're getting income. and Or I, I think it's actually at the current price. And but so you're going to vastly underperform. So since that launch, Bitcoin's up 53 percent, and YBTC is up 20 percent. So you're you're underperforming by 33 percent. Back to my conversation with Guy. So last week, MakerDAO allocated about 100 million dollars worth of Dai into USDE and SUSDE, which is staked USDE, through the DeFi lending protocol Morpho. And then this week, it also announced that it would allocate an additional 600 million. And we saw a bit of controversy after that. You know, after these moves, Mark Zeller of the Ave Chan initiative proposed that Ave revoke Dai's collateral status on Ave. And uh, Nostra Finance on StarkNet also decided to disable it. So, what do you say about USDE being the spark for these controversies? Yeah, I think from our perspective, we obviously we're not here to sort of pick sides or be involved in sort of like an argument between two other like enormous DeFi protocols that obviously we have like an enormous amount of respect for and like look up to as like teams that have been here for years producing what I think are like super useful products. Um, I do think there's probably been a bit of an exaggeration sort of like blowing up in, in the last few weeks, which I think has sort of gone a bit beyond and actually is probably tied to more like relationship issues that sort of go back a bit beyond like Athena actually being around. Um, what I would say is that like on our side and, and from what I've seen from the maker team, a lot of the criticism has been around, I think the speed and size with which they're sort of moving into this. I can just sort of say on my side, having sat on the other side of like their risk and diligence team, sort of going through this in the last few weeks, it's probably been the most thorough diligence that we've had out of like any party that we've interacted with so far. And I think from the Athena team in particular, we, and I put out a thread on this on Twitter last week. We are absolutely not here to try and encourage like excessive risk being built up within the system. I think this is obviously a new asset that exists within DeFi, and we need to actually just allow it to exist at a certain size before growing it too big. Um, I think the last thing that any of us want to do is start adding like excessive leverage in particular into the system. And so I put out some thoughts on this on Twitter last week, and I think we have just uh, basically acknowledged that we, we need to make sure that our incentives that we're allocating to this is not sort of like blowing up huge amounts of leverage into the system. I don't think it's an issue at all right now. Like Athena is like less than 2% of like DeFi TVL at the moment and uh, like less than 5% of, of global sex open interest. So we're not really at a size where it's like systemic um, in any way. Uh, but what we have committed is that some of the incentives that will sit around the stuff that, uh, that Maker is planning to do, we're going to be doing in a very slow and controlled way with like caps and savings as we do roll out. The maker controversy actually stems from earlier criticisms of Athena about the yields being quite high. And um, I guess your dashboard is, it's blocking like certain locations. So I couldn't actually see this, but I've seen commentary saying things like that um, the interest has ranged from 20% to 120%. Um, you can correct me if, if I'm wrong, since I couldn't access the, the dashboard. But you know, some of these critics are saying that Athena is essentially a Terra Luna in the making. So what is your response to them? Yeah, I think we can't control like the funding rates. They are like volatile and it's like really cool to the product, which is that's all we're tokenizing. It's that funding rate and, and sort of delivering it in the token. And so it varies. And we actually think it's more healthy for the market to have an exogenous interest rate, which is like set by the market and not controlled internally. Um, that's actually a much more healthy dynamic than what you saw with, with Terra Luna, where is basically fixing something at 20% and then, you know, plowing like VC money into that to try and sustain something that was was clearly unsustainable. Uh, so our approach to this is like the market is going to be setting the interest rate around funding and all Athena is doing is providing infrastructure to allow USDE to respond to that funding rate. I think more broadly, it really is like a very weak surface level <laughs> argument to like compare what Athena is doing to Luna. Like really the core difference here, you've just got to think about what is actually backing uh, the stable asset. So UST was literally backed by the Luna token, which was like a 300 volt asset uh, that moved up 100% and dumped 50% in a week. 
and had that sort of mechanic where I could test file. Here, like Athena's USD is fully backed, fully collateralized. That was not fully collateralized in any way by ETH, BTC, and corresponding hedges that sit behind it, in addition to an insurance fund. So really what I'd point to here as the core difference between a Luna and an Athena is that the backing is like real collateral that's sitting behind the stable rather than like our own government's token. And um, there are also critics who claim that this will only work in a bull market. What's your response to them? Yeah, I think uh, it's definitely a valid um, concern around this, which is like the yields are only the success of in the bull market, because when you ask like, where is the yield actually coming from? It's leveraged traders who are taking the other side to get long and pay for funding rates. Um, what we did see though, is that like, uh, even in 2022, when you add like the stake ETH together with the basis, you can still sustain rates that are above US treasuries. Um, but I do, I do imagine that in the bear market, you do, you do see a reasonable unwind of like USD's uh, supply as it sort of like finds a new equilibrium at a lower supply when the market doesn't have as much like long interest. Uh, but this is something that we're, we're also okay with. Like I said, this is just something that is responding to market dynam- uh, dynamics. And if there is less leverage demand to be long and the interest rate is lower, we're going to adjust to a smaller size until, until that does make sense. I would also just point out that like the current design is obviously purely based on this sort of tokenized cash and carry, uh, but there's no reason that like further down the line you could ever explore taking a route like some of these other stable like assets and deciding to reallocate to something which makes a bit more sense in the bear market, whether that's an RW way or something else. So that flexibility obviously sits here and it's much easier to go from Athena to RWA rather than RWA to build Athena. I would sort of view what we've done as like the moat and like the key piece of infrastructure, which is hard to replicate. And if there's a decision to go and do something else, uh, if required during a bear market, that decision is much easier for us to take rather than someone to, uh, sort of moving into what we're doing. And so um, you've kind of referenced a few of these things, um, and I recognize like some of this uh, may depend on governance. But you know, you have certain uh, kind of safeguards that you put in place, such as the Athena Insurance Fund. Can you talk a little bit more about how you expect those will work? Yeah, at a very basic level. It's exactly to the point that you're actually getting to there, which is what we what we've observed historically is that funding rates exhibit like a very positive skew. So when times are like good, it's excessively good. So you get funding rates of like 60, 70 percent. And when they're bad, it's like it might might dip to minus five percent for a couple of days and then it goes back above zero. And so given that, it makes sense that during um, extremely excessive conditions like we've seen in the last few months, all you're doing is capturing some of that yield. And putting it in a rainy day fund for when things are not as good, you're sort of just smoothing that out through time. Uh, so really, it's just there for when the rates do start to turn. And if you ever do see negative funding, you just have a pot of capital there, which can sort of provide a bit of buffer through those times. So really, that's what all it's trying to do is, uh, if you can think of the funding rates and stuff that goes to really high extremes during the bull, and then sort of dips like shallow below zero in, in the bear during times, all you're trying to do is just clip a little bit off uh, during the bull market to to sort of get you through that period. Well, so at this point, you know, as we've discussed, it looks like Athena has been very busy when it comes to various business development initiatives. So after Bitcoin, which other tokens are next? And then what other developments do you see on your roadmap? Yeah, I think um, one interesting development in the last year has actually just been the rise of Solana and like the the growth in both like Solana and the asset and then the derivative market that sits around it. So it's definitely at the size now where it sort of makes sense for what we're doing. And it's obviously an ecosystem that's seen like a lot of attention on chain uh, in DeFi. So that's definitely something that's on our radar and that we're thinking about. I think it's more what you sort of see with DeFi integrations, which we've got um, quite a few new interesting ones that are going to be going to be coming out that sort of look very similar to, to Maker. Um, and you can sort of think about it as, you know, a dollar or like crypto native money is like the killer app of crypto and it sort of is the lifeblood of all of these applications where whether you're a market money market a dex or more like a petrols platform all of it sort of requires dollars to actually sort of function and so we sort of view ourselves as just like a piece of infrastructure that can fit into all of the different applications but i think actually most interestingly it's thinking about how this can actually come into cfi because one thing that i think people don't appreciate is actually like the this the actual size of the market for just using USDT on perpetual perpetuals on sexes. So if you're going to be margining a perp, there's twenty billion dollars of USDT that's just sitting there and earning no interest for like the traders who are who are like long a perp. One really interesting concept here is that you've got uh USDE, which has got like the embedded yield, 
and you can actually use that to then trade on the other side and sort of get paid on your collateral. And so for some of like the more like the, like more capital focus like firms who who are really like focusing on on efficiency, that's like a really big deal for them to to sort of capture that yield while they trade. So uh, we sort of see ourselves plugging into DeFi, and then like the next step is really trying to embed ourselves in a more serious way within DeFi. Huh. Okay. And would that happen just through like business partnerships directly? Yeah, and I think um, one thing that looks like unique about Athena is uh, I think we're the first project where you've got like the five largest exchanges as as investors, and I think part of that was us trying to get them aligned so that we can try and actually integrate with that distribution um, going forward. So, yeah, that, that was sort of like cool to to the idea of that. All right. Well, this has been a super interesting discussion. Congratulations on all the recent developments, and we look forward to seeing what happens with Athena. Thanks so much. Appreciate that. Don't forget, next up is the weekly news recap, today presented by Unchained contributor Megan Christensen. Stick around for This Week in Crypto after this short break. Here's the final clip from Bits and Bips, in which James Seifert asks Ari Paul to explain perpetual futures. Though this is a slightly longer clip, I think this description will be incredibly useful, even to longtime crypto people who aren't big traders. Ari, explain what perpetual funding sure. rates are. Yeah, so uh, perpetual futures were, um, I don't remember when they were first invented. They came from traditional finance, but they weren't widely used. Arthur Hayes popularized them. They basically, like some small exchange used them some point 30 years ago. Arthur Hayes found that model that was basically dead. Uh, so I give him some credit for for the creativity to like revive this old dead model that no one cared about. Uh, and he applied it in BitMEX uh, to crypto, first with Bitcoin, then Ethereum. I think they maybe added Solana. And the idea is it's a future that doesn't have an expiration. Well, how does that work? So it's a future that has, uh, I, I, I don't want to mess up uh, articulating this. It's not that complicated, but let me make sure I, I get it right. Um, so with any derivative, you need something that ties it to the underlying price, right? So if we have an ETN and it doesn't settle for 30 years, we know that can diverge pretty dramatically. So how do you keep a perpetual future? Like what anchors it? Well, the idea is that uh, the difference in price between the perpetual future and the underlying will, you'll have some algorithm, some, it, not AI, just some um, formula to create a funding rate that one side has to pay. So if the perpetual future is trading over Bitcoin, then anyone who's long it is going to owe a payment to anyone who's short it every eight hours. And it, 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 a lot of crypto exchanges use eight hours as the time frame, just arbitrarily. And so that produces this natural tether. So it can deviate arbitrarily far, but you get into a thousand percent funding rates, it's not going to stay there very long, right? People go broke very quickly. And so it, it, there is this very strong rubber band that forces it to converge to- Every value. eight hours, essentially, right? Is what you're saying? Um, so every eight hours, I believe the, the formula is applied, right? So every eight hours, a snapshot is taken. What's the difference in price? Let's apply this formula. The longs pay the shorts or vice versa, depending on who's kind of creating the, the things out of whack. So with this said, um, so what that literally means is this Bitcoin, you you had the option, uh, at least for individual days, uh, where it averaged 100%. What that means is I, as an investor, could have earned 100% annualized rate for that one or two days for shorting Bitcoin. So I could have posted Bitcoin as collateral, shorted, had no economic exposure, collected 100% annualized for that one or two days. Um, and OTC deaths were at around 30% for that kind of two week window. Uh, basically, the cost, and that was for collateralized loans. So basically, the cost of capital in crypto, the risk free rate was arguably something like 25%. You could borrow or lend at. Did you know you can buy and sell crypto with tax benefits in an individual retirement account? iTrust Capital makes this possible. But what does this mean? When you buy crypto outside an IRA, like on an exchange, you face taxes on gains. But in an IRA, like a Roth IRA, gains can be tax-free. iTrust Capital also has some of the lowest fees in the industry and 24-7 accessibility. Start now and maximize your retirement savings with iTrust Capital. Welcome to this week's Crypto Roundup. In today's recap, we're covering Wormhole's massive $2.4 billion airdrop, the Ethereum community's debate over a proposed change to its monetary policy, Binance's defense of its detained compliance chief in Nigeria, Ripple's plans to unveil a USD peg stablecoin, a technical glitch freezing $24 million in Seoul on Lido's staking protocol, venture capital firms signaling a bull market with new crypto funds, Jupiter tokens all-time high amid governance vote controversy, the DOJ's wallet transaction to Coinbase Prime, record revenues for Bitcoin miners before the upcoming halving event, 
and the FTX Estates repayment plan set for the end of 2024. Thanks for tuning in to the Weekly News Recap, written by Juan Aronovich and edited by Jacob Oliver. I'm Megan Christensen. Let's dive right in. On Wednesday, Wormhole completed its much-anticipated airdrop, distributing 1.1 billion W tokens to early adopters of the cross-chain protocol. Following the airdrop, the token began trading at around 160. However, the price experienced a swift decline during price discovery before settling at around 140. With the token's rebound, Wormhole's market cap grew to approximately 2.4 billion. The Wormhole rewarded users from several blockchains, including all major EVM-based chains, such as SWE, Osmosis, Injective, and even the defunct Terra, the W token was only claimable on the Solana blockchain, which suffered some congestion issues as users reported failed transactions. The Ethereum community was at a crossroads this week, with a proposal to adjust its token issuance model sparking widespread debate. As staking on Ethereum grows, researchers Ansgar Dietrich and Casper Schwartz-Schilling suggest revising the monetary policy to mitigate potential negative impacts, like inflation for non-stakers and increased centralization. Their proposal aims to balance the staking ratio, but it has met with resistance from some parts of the Ethereum community. Critics argue that altering Ethereum's foundational economics could compromise its integrity and deter institutional investors. With the staking rate rising, 31 million ETH are currently staked. Concerns about Ethereum's future and its currency's role are intensifying. The proposal's supporters believe it's a necessary step to ensure Ethereum's longevity, while detractors see it as a threat to the network's principles and market stability. On Wednesday, Binance issued a public statement defending Tigran Gambarian, its head of financial crime compliance, who is currently detained in Nigeria on suspicion of committing several financial crimes in connection with the exchange. Binance emphasized that Gambarian lacks decision-making authority within the company and should not be held accountable for company decisions. Nigerian authorities arrested Gambarian and Nadim Andrewala, Binance's regional manager for Africa, in February subsequently accusing both executives and Binance of tax evasion, money laundering, and operating without a license. They were set to be arraigned in the country's federal high court on April 4th, but that has been postponed until April 19th. Gimbarian and Andrewala have both sued the Nigerian government for human rights violations. Gimbarian remains in custody. However, Andrewala managed to escape detainment and leave the country in March. His whereabouts are unknown. On April 4th, Ripple announced its intent to release a U.S. dollar peg stablecoin aimed at serving enterprise clients and payment companies. This new stablecoin, expected to launch later this year, will be supported by USD deposits, short-term U.S. treasuries, and similar assets, with regular audits by an independent accounting firm. Ripple president Monica Long emphasized the stablecoin's potential to facilitate institutional and decentralized finance applications across the XRP ledger and Ethereum ecosystems. An operational hiccup in Lido's smart contracts on the Solana blockchain has locked in approximately 24 million of Sol, preventing users from withdrawing their stake tokens. The issue, detailed by Pavel Pavlov, a product manager at P2P, the entity managing Lido on Solana, stems from a flawed smart contract function that complicates the withdrawal process. Pavlov highlighted the problem in a Lido Discord channel post on March 30th, stating, quote, The current implementation uses the split function in the withdrawal process of the smart contract, which is quite significant in terms of complexity and time to amend, end quote. He further mentioned that the technical team is planning to coordinate with Lido DAO to discuss potential issues and timelines for resolving the issue. This setback follows Lido's decision to discontinue its protocol on the Solana blockchain in October, after a vote by the community. Although users were given a deadline of February 4th, 2024, to unstake their assets, the recent discovery has made the process exceedingly difficult, especially for those unfamiliar with the protocol's command line interface. A post by Jay, a member of the liquid staking protocol, Sanctum, conveyed the frustration of users dealing with the CLI's complexities and reported malfunctions. Jay also pointed out that while Sanctum offers an alternative on staking service with minimal loss, this option has not been adequately communicated to Lido's users. Crypto venture capital firms are making bold moves to raise substantial funds, 
signaling expectations for a prolonged bull market. Paradigm, a leading venture capital firm, is seeking to raise between $750 and $850 million for a new fund, according to Bloomberg. This effort, aiming for the industry's largest raise post-crypto winter, underscores a rejuvenated interest in cryptocurrency investments. Similarly, Galaxy Digital has plans to launch a $100 million venture fund targeting early-stage crypto companies. This marks a strategic shift for Galaxy, which previously invested its own capital and is now expanding to include external investors. The fund, named Galaxy Ventures Fund 1 LP, aims to invest in over 30 startups over three years, focusing on financial applications, software infrastructure, and crypto protocols. These initiatives arrive amid a burgeoning crypto market, further evidenced by a 52.5% month-over-month surge in VC funding for crypto projects in March. Jupiter's governance token, Jupe, achieved a new all-time high on Sunday, reaching $1.92 in the midst of a governance vote to allocate 4.5 million Jupe tokens to its core working group. The decision has sparked mixed reactions within the community, with 75% voting in favor despite some expressing strong disapproval on forums and social media. The allocated funds aim to support Jupiter's core working group's efforts to advance the decentralized finance within the Solana ecosystem. The decision has led to concerns about the size of the allocation and its impact on the project's future, with critics arguing the allocation is excessive without clear performance indicators or accountability, suggesting it could risk the project's success. A crypto wallet belonging to the U.S. DOJ that holds approximately $2 billion in Bitcoin seized from Silk Road executed a transaction to Coinbase Prime on April 2nd. The wallet transferred 0.001 BTC, signaling that it might have been a test transaction. Soon after, an additional 1,999.999 BTC, valued at $131.27 million, was moved to Coinbase Prime's hot wallet. The sequence of transactions, initially for a small amount and then significantly larger, suggests that the DOJ may be testing the waters before potentially liquidating or moving large sums of Bitcoin tied to the now defunct dark web marketplace Silk Road. Bitcoin mining operations hit a new revenue peak, garnering $2 billion in March, setting a record just weeks before the anticipated halving event that is expected to slash their earnings. This significant milestone surpasses the previous high of $1.74 billion in May 2021. The substantial revenue includes $85.81 million from transaction fees and $1.93 billion from block rewards. Foundry USA led the charge mining 1,300 blocks, or 29.4% of the total, followed by Ampool and other notable mining pools. The upcoming halving will reduce the reward from 6.25 Bitcoin to 3.125 Bitcoin per block, potentially halving miners' profits unless Bitcoin's value increases markedly. This adjustment occurs amid a backdrop where spot Bitcoin ETFs have dramatically increased demand, purchasing 66,008 Bitcoin in March far outpacing the 25,513 Bitcoin mined. The shift in supply and demand dynamics hints at a possibly different outcome post having than in previous cycles. The FTX bankruptcy estate has outlined plans to initiate repayments to creditors by late 2024, following an agreement between the Chapter 11 bankruptcy court in Delaware and the official liquidation proceedings in the Bahamas. This decision comes after acknowledging the complex situation due to FTX's accounting issues, with efforts to ensure no creditor receives less than they are due. Both legal entities have expressed a, quote, shared goal to distribute initial funds to verified creditors by year-end. Creditors have been invited to submit their claims through FTX's portal, initially set for closure on May 15th, though recent updates suggest an extension to June 2024. This process marks a significant step towards resolving the financial chaos surrounding FTX, providing a path for reimbursing those affected by its downfall. If you enjoyed this recap, go to unchainedcrypto.substack.com, that is unchainedcrypto.substack.com, and sign up for our free newsletter so that you can stay up to date with the latest in crypto. Unchained is produced by Laura Shin, with help from Nelson Wang, Matt Pilchard, Juan Aronovich, Megan Gavis, Shashank, and Margaret Correa. Thanks for listening. Unchained is now a part of the Coindesk Podcast Network. 
For the latest in digital assets, check out Markets Daily, five days a week, with host Noel Atchison. Follow the Coindesk Podcast Network for some of the best shows in crypto.